branch of service, U.S. Army. War served in World War II. Highest rank, Master Sergeant E-9. Eight of yours, you want that? Yeah, go ahead. Scott Springington, Don Byers. Okay, and the production crew? <clears throat> production, Barbara Dorr and Marlene Waters. Okay, all righty. Well, we thank you for coming by here and telling us a little about your military career. <clears throat> First of all, tell us a little bit about your your home. You came from the Eastern Shore, is that right? And at uh, that time, yes, it, it was, I was born on the Eastern Shore, Virginia. And what was your home? My home, the name, the town. You mean? Yeah. Polson, P-O-U-L-S-O-N, Virginia. Okay. And what you, your father was? What kind of work was your father doing? He was a a seafood man. And that's the best way to put it because he dealt in oysters, clams, and uh, and he had his own anything. Boat. He had his he had his boat. Old boat, yes. He had he had one of the oldest Ch Chesapeake Bay skipjacks on the water at that time. Uh huh. And you, of course, learned how to drive that boat, did you? Yeah. Okay. And, uh... So you were pretty isolated there. Now, now, how did you get anywhere from the eastern shore? How, how could you get to Norfolk? There was a steamer named the Virginia Lee that ran from Cape Charles, Virginia, and stopped off at Fort Monroe and proceeded on to Norfolk. And then she did, she made three trips a day like that. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, that that was the only way you had. How long did it take to get from uh, uh, the eastern shore? You but, were more or less on the tip of the eastern shore. Uh, how yeah, long near about 20 miles from Cape Charles where I lived. And, and uh, it was about an hour and a half trip from, from Cape Charles to Fort Monroe. Well, tell us how you got interested in the military service. You were a young man at that time. Yeah. I was in the tenth grade. Tenth grade, a big school, was it? Yeah, high school. It, 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 that's that they don't have those separated like the junior high. There might be one or two over there now since it's expanded. So, but then you had from the first grade clean on through the twelfth grade. It was really the old one-room schoolhouse, basically, yeah. was it? <clears throat> well, mine happened to be a. A brand new one when I got, uh, well, the first one I went to from the first grade to the fourth grade was a, a wooden two-story building. That was up in uh, Accomack County where my daddy first lived. And he owned a little farm and, and it had a, could keep his boat tied up out to the dock right out to all Chesapeake Bay. So... He had one crop, and for a few years he'd plant strawberries, and he had a strawberry patch, and he he worked the summer on that, and the winter on the on the water. Oh. <clears throat> but <clears throat> well, let me get back to the. Uh, you were in the tenth grade, I think, and you were getting interested at that time in the military service. <clears throat> What's when, that? When, when were you thinking about uh, joining the service? Well. In 1929, I think all of us know just about now, or studied about it, it was off of the suppression it ever was. Well, you had a, uh, a friend who was talking to you, I think, about yeah, he, joining. I, uh, he, uh, he was a schoolmate of mine, but he was a couple grades ahead of me, so when he graduated, he graduated from high school, and he joined the army over there at Fort Monroe. And his brother and I was in the same grade in school. So we started in 1935, uh, December, we'll say, we started working on our parents. 
I saw it more paper to glue in the in the, uh, in the army. So he brought us home an application from Fort Monroe, and uh, I put it on the table. I said, "All you got to do is sign your name right there." I said, "I can get in," but I said, "If you don't sign it, I can't get in." So my mama said, "No." Daddy said no. So then I went to work on him. And finally, Daddy gave in. And Mama followed. They signed the paper, and I put the date in there. So I put uh, 1917 instead of 1919. And, uh, I, and we, had, we had $2 apiece. It cost 75 cents to go across to Fort Monroe. So him and I, one day, we, we got the best clothes we had on, but they wasn't too good, but they were warm. Because it was February, I see. So we came to Fort Monroe, went <clears throat> post headquarters. He went in, and some grouchy old sergeant said, what do you want? We said, we want to join the Army. He said, let me see your paperwork. So we threw the paperwork down on there. And he said, well, that's fine. I said, that's good. And he said, uh, let me fill out the paper. So he filled out a piece of paper. He says, take this over to the hospital and get an examination, physical exam. So we went over to the same hospital that's there now and went to a room and went in there and uh, some enlisted man, I don't know what he was, he said, sit down over there. Doctor be in in a minute. So the doctor came in and he told us then, he said, go in that other room and strip down everything, he said. Don't come nothing but your shoes on. Come back in here. So we went in the other room and stripped down. I mean stripped. Came back in and stood in front of the, he was as close to me as you are. Not closer because his desk was there and I, and I walked up, we walked up in front of him there, you know. He started asking us a bunch of questions about our health and everything, you know. Turn around, he said. Turn around and looked at him. And he said, turn back around. And he said, raise your leg. And we raised our leg, did whatever he told us to do, you know. Then he said, that's all. Go back in there and put your clothes on. And that was the physical we got to join the army. So, so help me God, this is true. <laughs> well, you were in at that point <clears throat> and what was your first assignment and my, where right my first assignment then when uh when i brought my paperwork back to him he says you're assigned to a battery of the second coast artillery he said that's inside the moat he said the first big building on your left that runs parallel so we went in there and reported, he and I did. And what was at that at that point? What was the basic mission of Fort Monroe and your job? Well, the I was I had to take I was supposed to take six weeks of basic training, and I was in the and it was so bad in February, the weather was so cold and bad. We had to do it in the day room. We couldn't get out on the parade ground right in front. It was so. Such cold weather and, and freezing and snow and doing everything. So uh, one day, just before our, our time was up, the first sergeant came in and he said, uh, I found out that you two men know something about boats. And of course, we both said, yes, sir, we sure do. So he, he said, get one of them push carts outside out there, load all your stuff in it, take it down to the boathouse to Sergeant Wick, that was the name of the sergeant. So I says, well, where's the boat at? Said, he says, God damn, this is a small post. Just go west, he said. So we went down there by the Chamberlain Hotel, and sure enough, there by where the rail, railroad track, the train came down there. And on the other side of the train track was a little house built out over, over the water. And that was where, where we slept. But uh, 
And so my buddy got signed to a, a small boat, what they call the uh, yawl boat. And uh, I got signed as a deckhand on the L boat, which was a six to five foot boat. And uh, so, so what did that boat do? Because the mission of Fort Monroe, that, that, that was naval guns. Yeah. Is that right at that time? Huh. Uh, Fort Monroe was protecting the harbor, yeah. Hampton Road. They planted with, with, the mines, yeah. And, and, uh, but go, go ahead. practice on them, we never did put that. that. Not then, they did World War II, though. They, they had them armed, right? But I wasn't there then. Uh, okay, so, so uh, what was that boat you were on used for? L boat. She, uh, see, we'd plant a shore cable out there and we'd put a buoy on the end of that shore cable. And then when we got ready to plant mines, we'd, we were the first boat to go out there. If we'd take up that, we'd ex they, 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 from the shore they'd explode that, that uh, 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 buoy from, the, by, from what was the anchor, and that would come to the top that had a rope on it that was tied to the shore cable. We'd pull all that up and put it on the boat it hooked it into what they call the, the distribution box. Okay, and this was basically training, is training, that Training, yeah. It was a, and uh, and uh, it was a research, too. It was a... Uh, yeah, because, of course, it, the war was yeah. not on at that time, and they wouldn't... At that it was time, part they, of the Coast Artillery School, really. Okay. And, and uh, so what was your specific job on the boat? What did you do? When I first went on there, I was okay. a deckhand. Okay. Just a general monkey. Okay. And then a little later, you got promoted, right? I did, yeah. I was, uh, I was only there about, on that boat, about three weeks. And uh, the uh, captain of her was a Sergeant Wick. It was in charge of the whole work. St staff Sergeant. He made staff sergeant. So he he called me one morning when we went down there. He said, come in here. So I went in there. He says, you've been promoted by me, but you ain't going to get no money out of it. I said, well, that's not sound right. He said, well, just be good, pay attention. So he said, you're, you're now my first mate. So he said, you... Said, well, I want you to stay right here by me every for the next two weeks. Then we'll see what happens. So two weeks later, I had been promoted to the first and first. It was first class private and first class specialist, and that that paid as much as the staff sergeant did. But it didn't have no, no benefits, no, no not like a, a, a officer NCO. Okay. You just was a laborer, but you you got the money for it. So I uh, I did. I thought it was so good. So I really put out. <laughs> well, you actually drove that boat, didn't you? You were you skippered her. Yeah, you had to, and uh, you had to learn to do that to suit him, and he was a tougher. Uh, but he didn't force you. He didn't force you on anything. But already I knew how to, you had a user because I did run my daddy's boat up so many times, you know. Yeah. Uh, one of the missions, in addition to uh, practice mine laying and I presume retrieval, uh, the boat also was used to tow targets. Tow targets, yeah, for those artillery guns at Fort Monroe. And I had a little experience. It's worth telling. One day we were pulling a target. And I was sitting on the stern of the boat, uh, reading the newspaper. And all of a sudden, it was like, hell broke. And some National Guard outfitted was firing that day. And they dropped one of them dummy shells right on the stern of the boat. It was close to me, it was near to you. And it, uh, of course, it cut the cable and towed the target that they were shooting at. And old Wick, he was up there skeptical and thing that day. And uh, he said, pull that damn red flag down. So I pulled it down. 
And he come to the docks. He left the boat. He left the target clean out there. And he told the told the colonel. He said, if you want that damn garbage, you can send another boat out to get it. I ain't going out. So tied her up there. And that if we didn't get much damage, we had to go to the shipyard for about three or four days. But that that's a, so then the, I said, Well that this that scared me to death, boy. I said, I'll never stay back there again. Of course we went back to pull up the target again. They had another boat there that pulled targets, but but she, she was always tied up too. Well, uh, after a while, <clears throat> you got sent to another school. Is that right? I got yeah. Uh, the Coast Artillery School was in the school I think the Army had. Seemed to me like it was anyway. And uh, I had a friend that was a. Uh, the officer in charge of our boathouse down there, and it was a it was the staff sergeant that was the radio operator on that all the boat we had. I didn't know it, but the the the, the one that was the staff sergeant and it was a radio operator. He was also a first lieutenant in the reserves, so him and that lieutenant was the buddies. They, I mean, they they run the outfit, and uh, so they both called me. I said, I can't, I can't make that. I quit school in the tenth grade. I said, I don't think I can pass the test. He oh. said, Oh yeah, you you can pass it. Uh, what, we'll see that you pass it. Uh, what test was this? That was a written test. That you took before you could get into school. So uh, I went to the YMCA and took a and paid five dollars for a uh, a course in, uh, in uh, mathematics, you know, and uh, and some other stuff, a little bit of. And uh, they couldn't improve my writing though. That was. <laughs> but you made it. You, I you, made it through the school. Okay. And uh, when I made it through the school, it was eleven months course. I'd like to put that in there. Eleven months. Eleven months, and you, and you went to school from eight in the morning until four, put time off for lunch and everything, five days a week, and you went to school a half a day on Saturday. Then you were off all day Sunday, and you came. You had to be back there at six o'clock Sunday night and go to to what they call study hall on Sunday night. And I asked the other instructor what that was for. He said that be sure you damn people would be sober the next day to come to class. That that was a little different army than it is today. I oh, think. Oh yeah. And, uh, but uh, they, uh, it was the best school uh, I've, I've been, I went to a, at least five schools in the Army, various types. Uh, the last one I went to was Nuclear Weapons Assembly School. That's where I retired, I know. That's interesting. We'll get to that <clears throat> in a little bit. Okay. Uh, when you graduated from the... Uh, uh, Coast Artillery School, uh, you were involved in that big 1941 exercise, weren't you, in Louisiana? The uh, yeah, but I'd been transferred. I'd done been. See, they took me right out of the mine plant the, when I graduated from school. <coughs> Signed me to a, a field. I mean, a anti-aircraft artillery battalion. We were formed on the parade ground at Fort Monroe. It was a brand new outfit, and uh, I started off as a staff sergeant in that. I lose lost money, lost money the whole time I was in school. A little bit, not much, but but I I made it up because I was wasn't long before I was a master sergeant. And how did you lose money? 
because I was a specialist, see, first and first. And that was equal to a, a staff sergeant's pay. And if you had any service at all, you got the service raises on top of that, see. And since I was, and uh, we were transferred from the parade ground to Fort Story, Virginia. And where's Fort Story located? Over at Virginia Beach, right at the, right where Cape Henry Lighthouse is. Cape Henry Lighthouse was close, it's near that wall, the must barracks that I slept in. Bust your head when she blowed that horn at night. And, uh, uh, yeah, what did you do at Fort Story? Were they setting up anything there? Oh, we, uh, we had, of course we were new, see. We had training on all of our weapons. We had places picked all around the Navy, Navy base to, to defend, defend the Navy base in case of war. And then, then the Louisiana hit us. And we, we started off at, in the, outside of Fort Bragg in North Carolina. And, and then they decided they were going to fight their way clean. And we ended up in Louisiana. And then we came back home from Louisiana. And my field gear, field gear was laid all on the floor. And my quarters were World War II was that. And your quarters were what's that? Well, World War, my field with equipment was laying in the floor of my quarters. And uh, that Sunday morning, my neighbor lived there. We lived in a warehousing project. And he come banging on my door. And they hollered, get up, get up. He said, come on, we got to go to the barracks. He said, the Japs boop. Pearl Harbor. Oh, now this is when you got back from Louisiana exercise, uh -huh. and this was Sunday, December 7th. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, go on. So he he picked up. Uh, so I said, you must be crazy. He said, no, I'm not. He said, I I'm standing out here with all feel full gear on. And I got up and walked to, through the kitchen to the door. I said, he ain't lying. I went back to the bedroom, turned the radio on. I told my wife she was pregnant with him. And I had a little girl. She was just a year younger than he, uh, older than he was. And uh, I gave him all a kiss. We went out and set up our defenses. And we had the more bro broken down gear and everything tore up from the maneuvers. But some of it would work, you know. And we made a big show, and that was really a big show. We took up the defense at the Norfolk Naval Base. And, uh, of course, we got good equipment very, very short. Knew all, knew everything. Even got the first radar that ever was. And uh, thank you. He, uh, uh, so that's where you were at Fort Story then when you got the news of Pearl Harbor. Yep, and, Fort uh, Story. Shortly got uh, the best equipment that there was at the time. But you say you had radar at that time. Huh? You, you had radar? At we had, yeah, they had it. was called a SCR-268. It was, it was a test trial thing. And uh, we'd backed over the antennas and tore Tore them all up, too. Well, before you backed over them, did it work? Yeah, work, work good, but not, not like the modern stuff today, of course. But, but you had three uh, horns. You put air sets on and those, those three horns. You tracked the plane, like that, see? You tracked the plane with, a, with, a, with, the, with ears, uh -huh. sound. And that sent, and you, that sent the signal over to a, to a control that you could turn the handles. But they were automatic. Had the loaders, they would turn. We would, we would. However, they turned it. They would turn it. And uh, when they would 
push a button, say they were on target, you were supposed to pull the trigger. And it sounds like these, some of it was sound. Sound yeah, equipment. it was sound. Uh, yeah. Listening, those yeah. pictures you'd see of the big ears. And, yeah. And, uh, but you also had radar in addition to that, or was this the... This the yeah. The, they had them on their guns, too. Okay. Of course, the, of course, ever about every six months they came out with, with new designs and finally got it to where it was just about perfect. Well, before, shortly after that, or, or I should say when, when after that, did you uh, leave Fort Story because you got a new assignment? Yeah. We, uh, I can't remember, just war was on, but hadn't been on very long. When uh, the story goes, and I'm sure it's probably true, that Washington, D.C. was had a, was set up with any anti aircraft guns and searchlights by by a National Guard battalion. And some big wheel up there in Washington went out one night to check the the positions to see if the people was on duty. Of course it was still freezing then. So we went up there to about the first of March, I think, uh, war. and the, the, he told them that uh, anyway, he told the, the army there. He said, "You got to do something about that." And he told the story to him, you know. So what they did, they uh, we had a commanding officer in our battalion. Who was the finest officer I ever? His name was Timberlake. Colonel Timberlake. And uh, he called us all together. He said, all the NCO. He said, we're going to have to move. Do you want to go to, to England or do you want to go to Washington, D.C.? We said we won't go to Washington. So they they swapped the outfits. We took 17, we took our trucks and the stuff that we needed in the trucks and they took theirs and went to Washington. They came to down to Norfolk. We went to, to Washington. He said, now let me see them go home and go to bed. Uh, and that was a, where, where were you assigned uh, specifically in the Washington area? Did you cover a number of locations? Yeah, I had 15 searchlights to keep maintained, but I had two two other staff sergeants to help me. It was three of us. Yeah, at what part of the city? Any particular part of the city? Huh? Any any part of the city, or was it all? Oh, over? it was all, all right. We had searchlights over in Alexander, and, and some over in edge of Berlin, cause they had such a range on them that you could cover the whole whole city with them. They had uh, any aircraft guns too, all the way around up where, where, did, did you, you uh, and, and your fellow soldiers, uh, did you really think they might, enemy airplanes might come? I tell you, we were so busy that we didn't have much time to think. Because yeah. it was a long flight at that but, time. But uh, one other thing, this colonel I was telling you about, he believed in training. And uh, we hadn't been there about six months, I guess, we were there. And uh, he said, uh, come out with order. He says, get ready and pack up everything. He says, we're going away from here, one platoon at a time. So go down to Bethany Beach, Delaware and fired at, or at uh, real planes, pulling a target. So we went, I was with the first bunch that went down there. And we were, they had rescue boats out there in the ocean, going back and forth in case when the, it was in what they called in pilots, they were civilian 
uh, I forget what they call them, what they were, but they were they were towing them small planes, had them with them small planes, towing the target for them. And we practiced firing live wire, live stuff at it. So one day we were we were doing real good, everything was fine. Next thing I know, here comes that one of them damn planes, could chug right now. Right in the water, right there in the ocean. They got off the target with them radars and uh, and, and slammed into the, the, the doggone tail of the plane. They saved the pilot, though, but they didn't save the plane. It was fun to see that thing. The, the, the tow target was still up there in the air. The plane was down in the water there. <laughs> Your crew didn't shoot it down. No. There was one of the others. No, that's know. right. Uh, well, you, after that, you uh, were sent to another assignment uh, because the war in Europe was going pretty well, I guess, yeah. advancing pretty far. I was assigned to the engi uh, combat engineer, the 588th Engineer Bridge Company, with my number. And uh, we took a, took a real a lot of training. We took 30 days of training. At Camp Shelby, Mississippi, loaded on the train and went to New York, loaded on the ship and landed in the Lahore, France. And getting into Lahore, France, you, I can tell you how bad it was. It was like the, trying to walk through a, a bunch of eggs. They had sunk ships all in the harbor. And we had to zigzag through like that to get get to a place to get the troops off and this when we of course that was about the war was about half over just about and then we I was in charge of a of a bridge platoon and uh, they had several different kinds of bridges they had what uh, Bailey bridge was the famous one and uh, so we, I, my platoon had two, two Bailey bridges. They were steel bridges. They would haul anything. But you had to keep close maintenance on them. And uh, I was up to a city, just outside of a city called Strasbourg. It's, it's now France now, but the Germans claimed it. And they, they finally settled it through it after the war that went back to France. And uh, so you, you were putting up bridges, and what were the bridges for? They were crossing the rivers. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you know about Germany and France like that. They call them rivers, but we call them creeks. But there was some real Nile River, you know, and, and all them other. There was big rivers as well as small rivers. What I was doing, see, since the bridges was already in, when I got over there, I had took my platoon and divided them up between bridges to keep it maintained, keep it so that Patton could get his army through. Uh, he he was in a hurry, wasn't he? He was that. Did, did you, you ever meet Patton? Yes, sir. One time. Uh, what was your impression? That he was a... Wonderful officer. And uh, I guess you, you and the, he, he uh, came up to a bridge where I had my men on it, and uh, this was what we call a pontoon bridge. It was a big rubber pontoons and had had wood on top of it. See, and that had to be maintained 24 hours a day because the sea clamps held it together, and if they got loose, see. You know, a big truck went on it. The whole thing would be, you lost everything. So I had my platoon working on this bridge and and I had to, held up the trucks about a half a mile. And uh, the next thing I know, here comes this Jeep boy. He was standing in the back. He got up there. I went up and saluted him. 
He said, Sergeant, what the hell goes on here? He says, that belongs to me. Them trucks are supposed to be moving across that bridge. I said, sir, that bridge has to be maintained. I said, and I don't, didn't want nobody to get killed or anything. He said, well, I want to go across. I said, give me 15 minutes to get my men off of there and you can go across. He sat down and put a bull look in his face. He said, go ahead, sir. He fixed it. We got the bridge in good shape, we said. He took off across there. They would start sending the trucks on across like that. That's the only encounter I had with him. But uh, he, he, he very near apologized for the way. Well, you, you uh, tell us a little bit about, you were uh, at a different location near Lübeck, Germany. And that was kind of interesting experience. You were putting a bridge across the river there near Lubeck. Do you remember that? Oh. And you were pretty close to the Germans on the other side. Yeah. Uh, tell that's us about where we got. That's where we got the worst trouble. I had to put a whole new bridge across that river there. They called it a river, but I call it a big stream according to what I knew about the rivers. And my bulldozer operator, he, he was, he'd been in World War I. And he was a bit, one of the best soldiers you ever seen. He didn't have to come over to the war, but he begged and pleaded. Anyway, so yeah, so there, the, and what, what they was took him, and uh, we uh, as I recall, that was a pontoon bridge, and the Germans was on the other side. It's the closest I ever got to them, and they. Uh, Were they fighting at that time? Yeah, they were, they, they were shooting at you. They were they started uh, shooting us with them 88 millimeter shells. They could they could they could thread a needle in there, boy. I tell you. And they blew that bridge all to pieces, boy. I mean, just tore it all to pieces, and it floated on down the river. And uh, I called my my company commander, and told him what happened. He said, well, I'll have you some help up there. Wasn't long before he sent an infantry company up there. And, uh, and they had a hard, art they had a heavy, heavy artillery with them. They come up there and they said, had observation people looking right over there. And they, they look, they, they were good, good people, boy. They were They'd give them the, the, the location of a gun, German gun battery way back in the line on the other side of the river, you know. And he says, get your men back there, back there. Get them back there, and they cut loose at them. And they bombed the, the old boy said they bombed the hell out of them. And they took off. And then I took, we took them across that river. And, and some of the boats we had, we had some small boats to use in fixing those bridges. And we took the, that infantry outfit. She'd carry a, a squad of men. So we took, loaded up about 12 of them boats and sent them across there. And they put them Germans on the move back towards home again. Uh, this was getting close to the end of the war, I think, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, getting close, very close. Uh, what happened just about at the end of the war? Because the, <clears throat> as I understand it, the Germans were not too happy to be captured by the Russians. That's right. I, I got to. I can tell you a little bit about that. The. I we closed off all the bridges that we could after the war was really signed, and I was sent to another another position 
on another river. I don't even know the name of it now. And uh, we were supposed to go over there and, and take that down and uh, lie the a light Americans to capture the Germans that was on the other side. So when I got there with my men, I got a little bit of work done and I looked and here come a, a whole German that looked at me like the whole German army. And, they, and they, the German officer stopped them on the other side of the river. And I looked at him, and some of them was in the water taking a bath, and they, he made them clean up. And then he, he lined them up, he brought them across the bridge and stopped them. And he came up to me and saluted me. And he said he wanted to, wanted to surrender because he said he'd, that's the words he used. I don't want them damn Russians to get a hold. And I said, well, I can't do nothing to help you. I said, I got just enough food to feed my troops that's here. And I said, yeah, what you need to do, I said, if they're in good shape, your men are. I said, just leave your weapons over there in a pile and head that way. There's, just, there's some Frenchmen over there. He said, they're just as damn bad. I said, well, well, that's the best I can do for you, the best I can offer you. So he said, all right, Sergeant, thank you ever so much. And he, he gave him the left face, I think it was, the forward march. That was the last I ever seen of him. He went back to the back with him, back there and sur surrendered him. And they were near about all like that. It sounds like he spoke English, is that right? He could. Yeah, he yeah. could speak perfect English. Probably was, a, well, educated in yeah. England yeah. the U.S. Um, so that was close to the war's end. What, uh, what happened when the war was over? Where were you and what was the reaction? I was right up there, well, outside of Strasbourg, still we're pounding away at bridges. And I had enough points to go home with the very first group. Because, see, I had two children. I'd been in the Army all them years. And you got so many points for all of that and, and whatever b battles they called. And uh, so they called my name and uh, sent me back to, to uh, in France. And... Uh, for the return home for discharge. And uh, so I got back there to this depot and uh, they give us all something to do, you know. So they sent me out to an engineer's depot. And I went out there and I said, I guess this will be three or four days and I'll get a, be called to go on a ship to go home. Well, it didn't happen that way. I, they sent me to the prison camp for the, the piece in charge of the German prisoners that was there. And uh, so I reported in there just like I was supposed to. And sitting behind the desk, I looked at him. He was a first lieutenant that had been in my anti-aircraft. <laughs> He'd been your what? Been in my ID aircraft outfit. I said, what the hell are you doing there, you prisoner? He said, no, damn, you come in here. He said, get out of here this desk beside me. He said, I need somebody like you. So I didn't see him anymore for a, for a week or two, I guess. Finally, come back over there and said, how's everything going? I says, doing wonderful. And... uh we had Polish soldiers that was guard dude, guard for the German. They'd take them out on details, you know, things like that. they run the camp, too. So, had a little episode there. Was where they, 
every morning I had to go over there and, and go through the barracks and inspect the barracks before we turned the, turned the prisoners out for to go to the job. So I went through there one morning and, and I went into one of the latrines they had there. And what do you think I found? Three Germans hanging from a rope. And I said, what? I said, what the hell happened here? He says, I don't know, Sergeant. This was a German officer, or not an officer, but an NCO. Uh, he says, I don't know. He says, but I got a good guess. He says, they found out, the Americans said, found out a lot about them. Said they were SS troopers and the, and the, and the German soldiers just hung them there. Said that the, the, the German soldier did not like the SS troops. He hated, hated them. They were his own own blood, but but he hated them. And he hung three of them in the latrine. So they found out who they were, and they sent them back to Germany and turned them loose. They, uh, they, they did nothing with them. They, 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 the Americans, the Americans released them to the Germans because they were dead. They would have. Oh, they, oh yeah, the, the corpses. Yeah, so they sent them back. Sent them back. That wound that up, and then I got. I figured, well, maybe that'll get me out of here. And it was still another month before I got out of there. And I come back, and it, here's how they sent me back. They put me on a on a German train and sent me to, to Antwerp, Belgium. That was a big port, and uh, they had to. Uh, they put me there. They sent me to Belgium. Sent me to Camp Top Hat and over there. No. I, I can't remember exactly what the name of the camp was, but they had all of them named something, you know. And the underneath of it, though, it said Colonel Alva C. Spalding. Spalding, commanding officer. So when I got off of that box car, that, I mean, the truck that hauled us from the station to the to the camp, you know, and I said, oh, the name up there. I threw my duffel bag down. I said, as many favors as I've done him, he better give me home. <laughs> so I went down to the headquarters and went in. It was in a tent. All of it was in tent. So I went in the tent and asked the sergeant major if, uh, if uh, the colonel was in. I can't think of his name now. That was Spalding. Yeah. Oh no, I'm sorry. He was a full colonel. Oh. I can't think of his name right now. Okay. Spalding. Spalding. He said, Yeah, he's in. Who wants to know? I so I told him who it was. So he went in there and told him. He said, Tell him to come in here. So so I went in and said I He said, How'd you escape death? I said, How did you you hide? He said, no. I said, well, neither did I, but I didn't get killed. He said, I guess you want to go home, don't you? I said, you're damn right I do. I, know. I said, I'm not lying about it. <laughs> I said, I, I was supposed to have gone home a long time ago. But I said, they never did call my name. Okay, he said, he said, uh, Tomorrow, he said, I'm going to Antwerp, Belgium, I believe was his name, to, to see General Timberlake. He said, I want you to go with me. So he said, he's the commanding officer of the whole shebang around there, Brigadier General. So. Next morning, we loaded up in a car, and the way we went to, to Antwerp, I think it was Antwerp, 
Brussels, maybe. And uh, well, but I was at both places, so we'll say that. And uh, the colonel and I went, and we went in the front office, I, you know. And the colonel said, uh, "Would you tell the general Timberlake we're here? I'm here." When I walked in, put my arm, he was a big 230-pound 200, man, every bit of it a man. He'd been a big football player in the Army. And, and so he said, sit down. So we both sat down, the colonel and I. And uh, I said, said to him, I said, glad to see you when I made it. He said, I'm glad to see you, man. He said, what are you doing here? I says, I want to go home. He says, well, you're going home. He said, but first you're going to stay here today. He says, you and the colonel. So he, he had a, a whack that was uh, his aide officer. And uh, he told her, he called her in there. He says, you go over to the officer's quarters and get the best liquor there is there. I have a quart of it. So he went. she took off, you know. She come back with a quart of some kind of liquor. I don't know what it was. And uh, he set up the bar, boy. And we we stayed there and rested the morning. And then we went to the, to the, to the officer's place and had had dinner. Came back and uh, stayed a while with him. Maybe had another drink. I don't remember that. But, but anyway, he said uh, he told the colonel that was in charge of that camp down there. He says you put him on a ship. The very next one that lands there, he said, go home. So that was fine. So the next two days later. They, they, they uh, called my name, went down. It was uh, all one of those old, old, she only had two holes on her. She was an old, old freighter. She'd make about five miles an hour. Six, I think they said. So you had troops living in one of, us, hole, one of her holes. The other hole was the kitchen where you went into to eat and back that hole. So that's what I come home on. Back to New York. Well, let, that was in forty-five. Forty-five. Yeah. Well, we're we're getting close. Let me ask you the, <clears throat> your career from that point on, real quickly. Uh, you got into electronic work, and then you were working with von Braun and the other missile early missile. Uh, producers. Yeah, I went to, to to I went back to Fort Monroe. Got it. Got into the submine depot again. Then they turned that over to the Navy, which you should have had it all along. And then they transferred me to Redstone Arsenal to the Missile Command. That's when I got to, with Von Braun and everything. Best assignment any man could ever want. And until I got the nuclear weapons. And, and do you, when you got into nuclear, this was your electronic background or yeah. experience. Yeah. Uh, you also uh, played a role in Enoetok, the first test of our uh, of our that, hydrogen bomb. Well, that's that's where we get into. Uh, okay. get into. When I left uh, Redstone Arsenal, I had to report to to the Pentagon, and uh, another master sergeant and myself, and I said, "Oh." He, he's done it to me again. When I got up there, it was my old colonel. And he said, now shut up and sit down. He said, I got the best assignment you ever had in your life. I said, I, I've just come back from overseas. Well, he laughed. He said, you're not going to overseas now. So he said, uh, "Going to sign you to the G 
Joint Task Force 7. I said, what the hell is that? He says, oh, I don't know. But he says, it's a, you'll be stationed over here at the Navy Research Laboratory in Washington. It was right on the Potomac River, across from the air field, air bay, air field across from the, air, the civilian airfield. So, got in there, and uh, and uh, about a week later, we uh, we were on that flying bird, headed for Pacific, and uh, we landed on that island, and it was nothing but a pile of sand from one end to the other. And you, you landed on one island, and you rode a boat over to the island where they had this nuclear device set up. And we, we had, we had, we had those electric recording instruments, electronic, everything. We had to set them up, and uh, they had a tunnel built out of sheetrock, I mean, out of plywood. It was two miles long, ran across, across a, a causeway that they built into the, to the big concrete bunkers where they had the instruments set. And uh, we, we got all that straight night, but we had a lot of problems that we had delayed us. One of the problems was we'd ship the electric cables over before we went, about a month, you know, so they'd be there in time for when we got there. And them damn things had corroded inside between the rubber and the, and the metal, and they wouldn't work. So they, they made a fast trip back to Washington Got all new cables. Looked to me like it was they were gone just overnight, it seemed like. Come back so we could hook our instruments up and everything. Then we went out on a went out on a big ship. I no I think so, yeah. Go ahead. They was they we went out on a big ship and uh stood out on the deck. They let us stand out on deck with those black glasses on and look at the thing when they touched her off. And they, they, we would looked at it, it seemed to me like it was a half an hour, but they said it would be 10 minutes. And you could see that big wave coming from that damn thing. And then they told all of us to get in the hole and to close up the hatches. They did that. When that wave hit us, we went up on top of it. I said, she's going to turn over. But she straightened out and went down the hill. As pretty as anything. And when, she, when that one was gone, the next one wasn't near as big. See, they could handle the ship, keep, keep it headed into the thing. Like that. that was five miles from the, from the site of the blast. So you were on a ship when they set it off. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think we better we'll, we'll pause now for the tape. Uh we're at the end of the tape. Uh let's go ahead and continue a few minutes with another tape if you can. Mm -hmm.